Okay, thank you, Abigail and Hardy. Before we get started, we do want to go over some housekeeping items. I know there may be some questions coming up throughout the presentation, um, so feel free to enter those questions in the chat box, um, and we will make sure to get to, to those questions um, as soon as possible. Um, also, we will be sending out a link in the chat for you all to fill, a, fill out a Google form if you are interested in taking any of the materials home, whether that's the recording, a checklist of financial aid for California Dream Act, resource handout, or a visual timeline of laws. Um, throughout the presentations, you may see this icon pop up, um, the little orange one that says take home resources, um, and that just means that um, when there is that icon on a slide, that there will be a take home resource um, added into your packet. Um, so yeah, just make sure to fill out that um, Google form so we can make sure to get that to you all. And also do want to provide a quick disclaimer. Um, we will, since we will be providing information on the FAFSA, California Dream Act changes, um, we do not have all the answers. Uh, we will just be sharing the information that has been confirmed and that we know for sure um, will be happening, um, but we still have questions as well. Um, so I apologize if we cannot answer your questions today, but we'll make sure to uh, continue to communicate any major changes and updates that are shared with us um, so we can all be on the same page. Okay, before we jump into the changes, I do want to provide a quick overview on 10,000 degrees. Uh, so we are one of the leading equity focused uh, scholarship provider and college success nonprofit in California, um, specifically Northern California. And our mission is to achieve educational equity and to support students from low income backgrounds too, but also through college to realize their full potential and positively impact their communities and the world. And a little bit more about 10,000 degrees, we are across eight Bay Area counties, um, Lake County being our most recent county that we just added. Uh, we've supported over 12,000 high school and college students across um, several different high schools, community colleges, and four-year colleges. Um, I think the biggest point here is that we award uh, $6.7 million in scholarships, and we've also supported students to leverage $32.5 million in free financial aid, which is huge, um, as well as um, helping our students graduate with 87% um, less student loan debt than the national average. Um, and then last but not least, our students that do start off at community college tend to transfer at a rate three times as fast as the national average, which is pretty cool. And we are happy to support um, our students. Okay, so goals for today, we will be learning about the confirmed changes to the California Dream Act. We will also be um, going through the changes to the FAFSA so we can understand what those will be looking like for this upcoming application year. We'll also review some tools and resources that you all can use to stay up to date on changes. Um, we're going to review a few scenarios at the end, and then we will have time for questions and answers. First, we want to start off by sharing the California Dream Act enhancements that will be happening for this application year. Um, we have four major changes uh, happening to the California Dream Act. Um, so the first one is that uh, the California Dream Act will be aligning with the FAFSA um, to make the deadline April 2nd. I know in past years, usually the deadline has been March 2nd, so they have pushed back that deadline to April 2nd. Um, the application is to open in December, just like FAFSA. Uh, we still don't have a specific date. But we did receive an email this morning saying that for sure the applications um, should be open by December 31st. Again, that can mean December 1st, December 15. We are not sure, but um, definitely going to be open by December 1st. Um, the second major change to California Dream Act is the inclusion of race, ethnicity, and gender questions. Um, these are optional for our students and will not impact students' financial aid eligibility. Um, this is only for research purposes only, so please make sure to share that with your students as you support them through this application. Um, the third major change is the AB 540 affidavit inclusion. So I know before um, students would have to submit a 
um, separate form to make sure that they are exempt from the non-resident tuition. Um, and it's commonly referred to as the AB 540 affidavit. So now that's going to be embedded within the California Dream Act. And um, we will have more information to show you how that looks like in the next few sites. And last but not least, our parent signature process will also be changing. So no more need to create the uh, PIN process. Um, the signature will be embedded within the application, which makes it a little bit easier for students and families um, to sign their application and send it out um, for review. Okay, so a little bit more about how California Dream Act will be mirroring the FAFSA. Um, what we do know is that they will be using um, unusual circumstances, just like FAFSA, as well as provisional independent status. Um, again, the student, gender, and race ethnicity questions um, will be similar to the ones on FAFSA. And also, they are working to update some of their terms. So, for example, um, previously, CADA and FAFSA were using EFC. Um, to let students know what they would have to pay out of pocket, but now they will both be um, using the SAI formula, which we will talk about in the next few slides as well. Okay, so how California Dream Act will not be mirroring the FAFSA. Um, as you know, FAFSA may, um, they will be reducing the number of questions on the application, but California Dream Act will be keeping the same amount of questions. Um, and specifically because they will not be using the direct data exchange tool. Um, so they will provide that manual option for financial aid um, info entry for our students and families. Um, they will also not be using the contributor role-based experience. Um, so, for example, in FAFSA, parents will have to um, create an FSA ID if they are contributing to entering information, but that will not be the case for California Dream Act. Um, they will just have to sign the application electronically. And then uh, the California Dream Act will not be using this question where both parents killed in the line of duty, um, simply because this question is used to determine eligibility for maximum Pell Grant, and that does not apply to our California Dream Act students, that only applies to our FAFSA applicants. Okay. So a few of the questions that the California Dream Act will be adding to the application are the following. Um, so they're going to be asking students if they want to opt in to receive any reminders from CSAC on financial aid updates or anything like that. Um, students do have the option to opt out at any time, so it's totally up to them. Um, they will also be asking as of today, what is your visa TPS status? So they know how to move forward with um, supporting students with the financial aid process. And number three, are you interested in California Dream Act Service Incentive Grant? So if the student says yes to this question, uh, DSIG flag will appear on the Cal ISIR, which is similar to what the student aid report was last year. Now it's going to be known as the um, submission summary for FAFSA. But for California Dream Act, it will be known as the Cal ISIR, uh, which stands for Institutional Student Information Record. Um, and then since it will be a flag on their application, um, the student can expect to be outreached by CSAC and college campuses um, to participate in this program. Um, so for this program, students can get up to 4,500 a year for doing community service or um, volunteer service, which is an extra form of financial aid. Um, last but not least, um, they also have uh, some questions that are mandatory, but students are able to select prefer not to respond if they are not comfortable with that. Um, again, this information will not be shared with colleges and will also not be listed on their Cal ISIR. Um, so student gender, race, ethnicity, and then primary language at home. Okay, so for the parent electronic signature process, again, this is one of the major updates. Um, so now uh, parents will be able to sign uh, the California Dream Act electronically um, instead of creating the parent PIN process. So that will be um, eliminated from the process. And then if parents are not able to sign when the students are ready to submit, 
that is totally okay. Parents can um, come back later and sign from the California Dream Act landing page, um, which is really great. So students can complete their portion and then just have their parents sign later on once um, they talk to them and they consent to the information. Uh, we did include a, a little screenshot here. Um, like I mentioned, there's a screenshot here of what the signature process will look like. So parents will just have to um, click the little check mark box to confirm and consent. Um, and then they will enter their name and hit submit. Um, so again, this is eliminating the uh, parent pin process for the California Dream Act. All we need is a signature now from parents. All right, um, so another major change, the new AB 540 affidavit process that will now be embedded within the online California Dream Act, which is awesome. Um, students will just have to submit this um, form once and then the student can update as needed. Um, once the information is sent to the schools that they're interested in, um, if they realize that they, you know, need to make a correction or there's a mistake on there, um, they can definitely do that and the schools will receive the new information. Um, once it's corrected, it's going to override the mistakes or the old information, um, but we always just encourage our students to double check with their schools to make sure that everything looks correct on file and, you know, just make sure everything looks good. Um, college admission staff can also access this um, information through a web grants report. Um, so that is also something that's coming up. And then uh, colleges are still going to be um, able to verify AB 540 eligibility. Um, so, you know, there might be some follow up um, processes that the student will have to um, take charge of. So just be aware of that. And then if the student decides to transfer to a different um, college university, they will need to re-verify their AB 540 eligibility with that new campus. Um, and then also the two-year community college cap has been removed because of the AB 1141. Um, so previously, only two years of community college would be able to count towards AB 540 eligibility, um, but now they've removed that cap. So it could be three or four years or as many as needed for community college specifically. Um, here in the next slide, we do have a um, picture of what the AB 540 affidavit process will look like on the California Dream Act application. Um, so I know I, I apologize, it's not the best picture. Um, all right, everyone, I hope you all had a nice two minute break. Um, I apologize for my Wi-Fi issues, I'll just be keeping my camera off for the remaining of um, the time that I present. Um, but we're gonna jump into the FAFSA changes overview and then I'll be handing it off to Abigail to dive in a little bit deeper um, on the FSAID process. All right, um, so for the FAFSA simplification process, uh, we do have quite a few changes happening. Um, so like I mentioned, the application is going to be open sometime in December. We don't know exactly what day yet, um, but we did receive an email that for sure the application should be open by December 31st. So again, this can mean open by December 1st, December 15th, um, but for sure, for sure, by December 31st, everybody will have access to fill out the application. Um, the second change is that the FAFSA look and feel has changed. So we, they are reducing the number of questions from 108 to 36. Um, also, an FSA ID will be required uh, for everyone to start the application, including students and parents. Um, and students will have to invite their parents or contributors, um, as they call it now, to complete their section on the FAFSA. Um, a role-based completion uh, will be required. Um, there's also new terminology that we'll be sharing on the new slide with you all. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about the SAI formula that is moving away from EFC, and then the direct data exchange tool, as well as the 20 colleges uh, listed instead of 10. All right, so some new terminology to learn and be aware of when filling out the uh, FAFSA or supporting any students. Um, again, the EFC is now going to be known as the Student Aid Index. Um, we'll dive a little bit deeper in the next slides, um, but now parent will be considered as a contributor. So anybody inputting information into the FAFSA will be known as a contributor. 
Um, there's no longer going to be a student aid report or SAR as we used to know it. It is now going to be known as a FAFSA submission summary, which is a little bit longer, but that is what we are calling it now. Um, and then number four, household size will now be considered family size. And last but not least, our IRS data retrieval tool will now be known as the direct date data exchange tool. Okay, so for the student aid index, this is a new formula that the FAFSA will be using due to determine um, students' financial aid eligibility. Um, so for this formula, uh, FAFSA will still ask for the number of siblings that are in college, but they will no longer take it into account. Um, so for this, uh, students do have the option to appeal to their financial aid office to see if maybe possibly they can consider that into their formula um, and adjust their financial aid packages. Um, so that is one thing. And then the SAI can be as low as negative 1500. So previously with the EFC, the lowest was zero. Now the lowest is negative 1500 due to this new formula. Um, and any students that receive a number between negative 1500 and zero will be receiving the maximum Pell Grant. Um, negative SAIs can be used by institutions to determine higher need. So it may vary per institution, um, which is why it is possible that financial aid packages may look a little bit different for every student for different campuses. Okay, another major change is that now students will be able to enter up to 20 colleges on their application. So previously it used to be 10 um, students would, let's say apply to 15 schools, they would enter their first 10 choices, wait for the application to get processed and then go back and make the correction to update with those remaining five schools. But now um, students will be able to add up to 20, which is pretty awesome. So they don't have to go back and make that correction unless they are applying to, let's say, 30 colleges. Um, they'll have to let the 20 process, go back, make the correction, let the other 10 process. Um, housing plans will no longer be asked on the FAFSA. Colleges will be taking the initiative to ask through the college applications for that information. Um, for family size, um, previously students reported household size based on who lived in the household rather than who was listed as a dependent. Now with the changes happening, um, the family size number is going to be pulled from the direct data exchange tool. So meaning that the dependents listed on the um, parent guardians tax forms is now the household size. Um, this is something that the students can go back into their application and edit and correct and adjust. Um, so that is an easy fix. Um, but a possible impact for our students filling out the application is that um, the household size may not be uh, representative of what's on the tax forms. So as a result, the SAI may be affected uh, because of that. Um, but like I mentioned, the student can go back and edit that number on their application. Okay, so needed documents. Um, this is a list of things that um, students and families are going to need to gather in order to fill out the FAFSA applications. Um, they're going to need to create an FSA ID. They're going to need their tax returns, um, specifically their 2022 tax returns for the 2024-2025 application year. Um, they're going to need to know how much they received in child support if that was the case. Um, they're going to be asking for asset information, including cash, savings, checkings, investments, any businesses or farms, um, any federal benefits received, and also a list of colleges so they can add that onto the application. Um, feel free to scan the QR code if you want to access a FAFSA checklist that's going to help any students or parents that you work with to gather the correct information. Um, so again, feel free to just scan it. If not, we are also going to send a take home resource with this slide. All righty, everyone. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Abigail to talk a little bit more about the FSA ID and role-based experience. Um, and Abigail, feel free to take it away. Awesome. 
Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, so like Barbara mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the process on creating the FSAD um, and role-based experience when filling out the FAFSA form. Alrighty, so changes to the process and particularly with the FSAID. Um, so anyone who will be filling out the FAFSA will need an FSAID. So this includes all students who are filling out the uh, FAFSA will need an FSAID. For married students, students spouse, only if the student and their spouse do not file uh, taxes together. Uh, and lastly, for parents and or step parents of dependent students, uh, which includes if they file taxes together, only one parent step parent will need an FSAID. Um, if they do not file taxes together, including if they are non filers, both parents step parents will need FSAIDs. And then lastly, parents without a social security number will need to create an, an FSAID, which is something new um, that has been updated with the FAFSA form. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like in the next slides. Other changes that are happening as well um, are that there is going to be a verified email address that will be required. Um, and lastly, FSA IDs will need to be authenticated with Social Security, which takes approximately three days. Alrighty, so before we jump into um, more information of what, um, you know, uh, parents without a social security number are going to be filling out or creating their FSADs, I quickly wanted to just um, talk with you all about the ID match and verification flow. Um, essentially, the ID match is to verify that the person creating an FSAID is that person. So let's say, for example, the user has a social security number, then it will go through social security administration to match that information. And hopefully um, by doing so, the user identity, identity is gonna be verified. However, if there are any, um, if the information does not go, go through, and that means that the user has to update information or contact SSA to uh, resolve the, um, the, the challenges that they're experiencing. What we are going to focus on today are the parents who don't have a social security number when they are creating their FSAID. So um, if the user does not have a social security number, then it'll prompt them to uh, a set of knowledge-based verification questions. Essentially, this is a set of questions that only the person who is filling out this part should know the answers to. Um, and we will show you an example of what that looks like in the next slides. And hopefully once they answer and if all the information is correct, then the user identif identity is gonna be verified. However, if they don't know the ID knowledge based questions, then they would need ID proofing, um, essentially ensuring that all the information is matching. And so once they do that, if that's an additional step that they um, that they have to do, um, then they will be able to identify their their um, identity um, until all their identity has been verified. They will be able to continue with the application process. So, again, something to keep in mind. So what happens with parents who don't have a social security number and they're trying to create an FSAD? Um, so in order for parents without a social security number, um, the sign-in will be the same as the parents with a social security number. Um, the only difference is that they would have to check the box. Um, so if you can look on the right, on the left-hand side, this is a screenshot that we have. Um, here at the bottom, it'll provide, it'll ask, um, it'll have a section of the social security number. However, in this case, if the student or the parent does not have a social security number, then they're going to go ahead and click on that box that says, I don't have a social security number. Uh, contributors will fill in their contact information as normal. And if accounts are not verified, uh, which is something really important to keep in mind, is that they will have limited functionality on the FAFSA application. Um, so a warning will come up um, that you can see here on the right-hand side. Um, so the user knows that they will not be using a social security number unless they fall under one of the options below, which are, I am a parent or spouse uh, of a student who is applying for aid and I do not have a social security number. Um, I am a citizen of the freely associated states and need to complete the FAFSA form online. We can go to the next page. Alrighty, so after students have created their uh, security questions, then they will be prompted to this. Uh, contributors will need to provide a mailing address. Uh, a mailing address uh, is optional for uh, parents who do have a social security number. Um, they're also going to have to include an address uh, that can, uh, but the address can be outside of the U.S. if they do live outside of the U.S. 
Um, and lastly, um, only phone numbers need to be with an area code in the U.S. So international numbers and those uh, numbers that are associated um, with uh, the Associated States numbers wouldn't work. Um, so side note, if a parent without a social security uh, number skips this, this screenshot will pop up and will not allow them to move forward with this step. Um, parents who do have a social security number will be able to skip these questions. But again, we're focusing on parents who don't have a social security number. So again, uh, it's really important that they fill out um, and this information as accurately as possible when creating their FSA IDs. In addition, um, contributors will need to set up their three methods for two-step verification, so essentially confirming their email and phone number. So again, on the right-hand side, uh, you can see a screenshot um, of what that looks like. Um, like I shared, they're going to go ahead and verify their phone number and also verify their email address. Um, in addition to that, they will have to go ahead and use an authenticator, authenticator app uh, that will essentially just confirm their identity when they log in. Um, something to keep in mind, too, is that there is an app that they can download to create the authentication piece. Um, so again, um, something to keep in mind when supporting uh, uh, students and families in creating their FSADs. <clears throat> so once we click continue, um, this is what's going to happen. Um, these are some, this is an example of the knowledge based questions that I shared uh, previously. Um, so like I shared, contributors will be asked a series of questions that only they would know the answer to. Uh, these questions will only appear once. So if they do not answer it correctly, uh, they will not be able to go back. Um, and like I shared, all questions must be answered correctly. Um, so this is uh, on the right hand side, an example of the, what the questions can look like, but not actually what they are. Um, so again, it's definitely going to be a learning moment for all of us to see what those are. But again, these questions, um, the person who is creating the FSAD should only know the answers to. Alrighty, so if all previous questions uh, were answered correctly, um, then contributors will be notified if their FSAID was verified. Uh, regardless of outcome, the FSAID will be created. Um, however, if it is not verified, they will not be able to input financial information until it is verified, which essentially uh, what, what would essentially happen is that their account would be logged. So there are two outcomes. The first outcome is that the FSAD is verified and is, is ready to use. So that means that everything is good to go. The second outcome is that the FSAD is not verified. Um, so again, if contributors get the screenshot on the right, that is letting them know that the FSA ID is already created but that they will have to call to, conf uh, to verify the information that they inputted. Um, contributors will also get an email with a case number once this, this pops up. So again, it's really important that their information gets verified as soon as possible so it does not delay the student's uh, financial aid process um, when they're filling out their FAFSA application. So what happens if the ver verification process does not work for contributors, um, then they would uh, essentially have to enter the information manually. So contributors will be prompted to call FSAIC at 1-800-433-3243. Um, and parents will also receive an email with the documents that they need to upload. So you might be wondering what documents might they request. Um, so they are might request an attestation form, uh, which is available on studentaid.gov. Um, and they might also request one of the following two options. So the first option would be a driver's license, a foreign passport, or state ID, or option two, a utility bill and municipal ID card, community ID, or a consulate ID. Um, so keep in mind that the utility bill and the municipal ID have to have the same address. So again, if um, contributors are going to be using that option, just making sure that the address is matching. Um, and then just lastly, once documents are uploaded via email, it will take approximately one to three days to verify um, their identity. Um, so the sooner the parents do this, the quicker inf their information will get verified. So what we the information that we do know right now, um, thinking about parents who don't have a social security number, is that again, a mailing address is mandatory. Um, the FSAID creation for contributors without a social security number will be available when the FAFSA open, which Barbara shared um, earlier that it's going to open um, um, sometime in December. It could be December 1st, December uh, 15th, but by December 31st, it should already be open. 
Uh, the information that we're still waiting on are the types of knowledge-based questions that will be asked. So the questions might be as simple as the questions that we shared in the previous slides, um, or they might be more complex. Again, we're still not sure what um, exactly those questions are going to um, be. Um, what the attestation form looks like. Um, and also, we're still not sure of what limited function FSAIDs can do. So again, more to come. Uh, we're still learning, um, and we're, we're definitely going to see that once the FAFSA form opens up. Something that we um, always want to highlight um, as part of our presentations um, is that we understand that parents might be afraid to share personal information, especially since they are inputting a bit more information this time around. However, please emphasize that there is FERPA, which is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Um, that is a federal law that protects all personal information reported um, in any educational document, which also includes financial aid and college applications. So all the information provided will only be accessible to the colleges in, uh, the student applies to um, or includes on their financial aid application. So definitely highlighting this with parents and families as you are supporting them with the process. Because um, again, it's really important that they understand that all their information is going to be um, confidential. So now I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, role-based experience. Uh, so first and foremost, consent. So every contributor who will be filling out the financial aid application has to consent before they move forward with it. Um, it's important to know that each uh, individual has their own application to complete and parents need to be there to access this part of the application, which is no longer than one form. Um, students must provide these details in their form to trigger parent contributors, um, and they have to include their legal first and last name, date of birth, social security number, and email, and an email address. So again, it's really important that all the information that they add um, and in this part of the application, um, that it is um, uh, accurate. Thirdly, uh, each contributor will receive an email immediately um, to log into the FAFSA and complete their section, or they can also log into studentaid.gov. Um, and then just lastly, uh, students can track uh, the contributor progress in studentaid.gov too um, to see how that process, process is looking like um, for if they filled out, if the contributors filled out the information or they're part of the application already. Um, so friendly reminder, if there is a mismatch of information, it can delay the process for the student. So it's important that they update it, um, update and again, provide that information as accurate as possible. Um, so what happens uh, to students when they're in the process of submitting? Um, so FAFSA is not completed until each contributor submits their form. Um, this could be uh, one to three separate submissions. Um, if students submit, uh, they will see a confirmation page with the SAI information, which is what um, Barbara shared earlier um, in the slides. However, if parents submit, uh, they will only see confirmation page with no SAI information. Um, and then just lastly, um, the application will be, won't be processed until everybody submits their portion of the application. Um, so again, really important that they uh, verify that information, submit that information as soon as possible so it does not delay the student's uh, financial aid um, application process. Alrighty, so when students submit, um, they will get a FAFSA submission uh, summary page, which is the same thing as a confirmation page. So what was shared earlier is that they're now replacing uh, what we used to uh, call the um, SAR or SAR. Um, it's just a new day. It's a new name. Um, it's just a different look um, and there's no acronym. So similarly to, um, you know, uh, the previous applications, you'll get the confirmation page, which is this, um, and you'll be able to see when the application was received, when the application was processed, um, data release number, and all the information, other uh, information that the student needs to know, um, in addition to next steps. I'm going to be um, covering how students are going to be inviting contributors onto their FAFSA application. Alrighty, so for dependent students, um, they're going to have to provide a little bit more about their parents' information. Um, so the FAFSA form considers their parent to be their legal, uh, biological, or adoptive parent. Um, the student is also um, is asked if their parents are married. So based on the response, it will prompt uh, further parent WIS questions. So if we take a look at um, the right um, 
the right hand side, the screenshot, it'll ask, are your parents married to each other? If the, the student answers yes, uh, then based on the information, the student will need to provide information about both of their parents on the FAFSA form. We can go to the next slide. Um, and so these are, um, so parent wizard questions, um, they will be asked, uh, which will help student determine which parents uh, should be invited as a contributor. Um, which parents information do I report? The student might be asking. So previously, uh, parents information provided was determined by whom the student lived with more, the la more than the last more than the last 12 months. Apologize for that. Um, however, now the uh, parent who provides the greater portion of the student's financial support in the last 12 months. Um, so again, on the right hand side, we do have a screenshot um, that is going to ask a set of questions. So are the parents married to each other? No. Um, do the parents live together? The student answers no. Did one parent provide more financial support than the other parent over the last 12 months? No. Um, and then lastly, has the parent you uh, identified in the previous question remarried? So if the student answers no um, uh, to all these questions, then based on those answers, the student will only need to provide information about this specific parent on the FAFSA form. So what do you need to know when inviting parents? Um, so like I shared previously, uh, parents invite must match legal name, date of birth, and social security number if they have one, or emailing address if they don't have one. Um, to keep in mind is that the email address provided for contributors does not need to match the one used for the FSAID. Um, second, only one parent information is needed to progress through form. Uh, second, parent can be invited by the first parent contributor if needed. And then lastly, um, any issues with, uh, with match need to be fixed uh, by the student. So essentially what this means is that what the student entered isn't matching their contributor's FSAID information. So if this does happen, um, guide the student through cross comparing what, the, what they entered and what their contributor's FSAID information is, um, and just figuring out what piece of information uh, was not entered correctly. Alrighty, so um, again, for de independent students, uh, inviting parents to the FAFSA form. So th again, these are some screenshots of what that looks like. Um, so parents who don't have a social security number, again, they're going to be asked to enter a mailing address. Um, again, all the information that the student and parents um, enter should use um, their legal name and just legal information that is um, that they have. Um, and then, like I shared in the beginning of the presentation, um, it would also ask, right, if, uh, if contributors have a social security number, um, and if they don't, then they're going to go ahead and uh, click on that checkbox. My parent does not have a social security number. Um, and again, making sure that they, um, that they add an email address um, and confirm that information. Um, so once all the information is entered, um, they will be prompted to um, an email um, that we will discuss in the next slide. Um, so when inviting contributors um, to the application, this is going to be an email that they are going to get. Um, so this is an email view. So this view demonstrates a parent uh, opening the FAFSA invitation. Um, and then once the parent selects log in, um, it'll take them to studentaid.gov. Um, so something like I've been emphasizing throughout the applicate, the presentation is that um, it's important that they check their emails frequently to ensure that they are submitting the information needed, um, because if they don't, this will delay the process for the student to submit their FAFSA form. Um, and they have to fill this out in order for students to qualify for financial aid. So again, it's really important that they um, check their emails and just making sure that all the information um, is accurate so they can continue with their uh, financial aid um, application process. Alrighty, thank you, um, everybody. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it on to Hardy, who will be talking about the our IRS consent through DDX. All right, thank you, Abby. Um, well, I think we can we can get started with the with the new change, right? The IRS consent consent to um, to the DDX. So the DDX stands for Direct Data Exchange, and this is now essentially substituting the RRS data retrieval tool that we used to use in the past, right? 
So the data retrieval tool was an optional tool. Um, students and parents could also submit their information manually, but the IRS data retrieval tool was there for students to use. So now with this new FAFSA change, uh, we will be using what we call the direct data exchange, uh, which essentially is what shares the, um, the tax information, the federal tax information with the Department of Education and all colleges that their students will list on their FAFSA. Essentially, parents will have to consent. That information will be sent over to the schools, and that's what they will be using to calculate um, the student aid index, so the new SAI. Um, also, again, as a reminder, every contributor on the FAFSA is required to consent, even if they don't file taxes, um, in order for the student to be eligible for federal aid. Um, also, the information that you know will be shared through the um, DDX will be transferred over, but will be hidden within the FASA application. Um, again, there is no opt out for this requirement. If the student does not consent, they can and will be able to enter the information manually, but they will not be eligible for any federal aid in their application. Um, again, until they do provide that consent. And that stays true for our parents as well. Um, if no parents, we can go to the next slide. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so the parent again must also approve consent to have the IRS directly transfer all their data. Similar to the student, data will be hitting on the FAFSA. Um, and again, if either the parent or student don't consent through the DDX, they will really only be offered loans. So it's very, very important that we're communicating this to our students um, because again, there's the new process. There's really no way around it. Uh, our only way for it to ensure that our students, you know, get qualified for financial aid is to um, complete that, that approval process. Um, I believe the only transferable piece of info that, you know, we will be able to edit um, during this process will be the household size. Um, but aside from everything else, again, both students and parents must um, verify through the DDX. Um, Hardy, if I can jump in real quick, um, just to uh, add a add a little bit more to that, um, the only financial aid um, that students would be eligible if they do not consent, parent or student, uh, would be uh, federal loans. Those are the, that's the only form of aid they would be. Um, eligible for, uh, they wouldn't be eligible for any of the Pell, for, uh, Pell Grant. Um, so again, if they don't consent, the only eligible financial aid that they would receive would be loans or federal loans. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. All right. So what's next? I think we can go on to the next slide. So in the meantime, right, um, there are some things that we are still waiting to learn um for their FAFSA and I think we can go to the next slide thank you thank you so we're still waiting on that official open day right you heard it Barbara Abby mentioned it still don't know when it is we got confirmation that it should be happening before October I mean December 31st um but we're still waiting on that I think the other thing too is what the annual income and tax information entry process will look like. So we know that some parents will and students will have the option to enter their information manually. We still don't know again what that would look like necessarily. Um, also, still waiting on best practices on how to advise on assessing the net worth of families, uh, family farms, and small businesses. We're assuming that all information might be pulled through the DDX, but again, we're still waiting on you know official confirmation on how that would look like. Um, and lastly, as well, how the better FAFSA, so how this new process will impact verification selection. Uh, we're still waiting on that. Again, more information to come, and once that does, we'll uh, we're able to get uh, more information and share it with everybody. All right. What can we do this fall before the FAFSA comes out? So again, we're still a few weeks out before the official um, application comes out. Some things that we can already begin doing is supporting um, those students that are able to and parents um, to create their FSA IDs, right? We know that you know some 
parents, especially those that don't have a social security number, might have to wait until the application officially comes out. But for those that don't have to go through this process, uh, so don't have to go through that process, can already begin creating their, their FSA IDs. Also, uh, we can begin talking to students about other financial aid forms that they might need to complete. Um, thinking the CCSS, C CSS profile, if applicable, is the perfect um, place to start. And also getting a head start. Um, identifying those students who might need you know, certain um, help in navigating certain processes, um, identifying any special or unusual circumstances, and having these conversations early on with our students, um, especially, again, those that might have a little bit of a challenging time um, applying to, to FAFSA when it does open. Um, also, another thing that we can do is leverage the FAFSA delay just to encourage our students to start applying to scholarships and, again, other applications that are out there. Um, and I believe we're coming towards the end of our presentation. We do have some couple of resources um, and upcoming events to share with you all. Um, and, you know, we're coming towards the end of it. And before we do so, we wanted to highlight some resources and, and upcoming events um, that will be happening within the next few weeks. Um, the first thing that we want to highlight and really encourage you all to take a look at is the FAFSA prototype. So this is a prototype <clears throat> that really anyone can use to explore essentially how the new application um, will be structured. Um, the specific scenarios that you, know, you can cover within the prototype are initiating a new application as a student over parent, um, completing an in-progress application as a student, parent or spouse, also coming corrections, scenarios, including missing clear, critical data elements, signatures, and again, voluntary uh, corrections as well. So we really encourage you all to take a look at this. Um, this will be part of our take, take home um, resources for you to use. And again, might be the, the perfect place to, to start ahead of the opening date that should be coming up soon, but really, really encourage you all to take a look. Uh, it's very beneficial. Again, this is just a, uh, the structure of how it looked like, um, but you know we're still waiting on the official um, application for that um, later in December. Also, um, some important forms to highlight, and this will also be part of our take-home resources. Um, there will be a paper form available for the FAFSA application. Um, again, we'll be sharing those with you all, and this is essentially a very uh, useful. Um, form, especially for troubleshooting or possible troubleshooting, thinking those students that, you know, or those students or parents that might have, you know, some challenges when creating their FSA IDs and might have trouble um, identifying, verifying, especially getting closer towards the end of the priority deadline, which will be April 2nd this time. Um, so for some, again, some parents that might have some challenges there, um, the paper form could, could actually be a great um, option just to ensure that you do meet that April 2nd deadline as we're approaching. But I think, again, as we mentioned earlier, we wanna stay ahead of this, right? We want to be able to connect with students early on and work with those that might have potential situations that again, might be a little bit challenging. So we address those early with time um, and we're not waiting essentially until the last few few days to, to submit and you know all the troubleshooting process. Um, but yeah, I think we can go on to our next slide. And on this slide, we're essentially just highlighting um, some FAFSA toolkits and FSA resources that have been provided. Um, everything here, we have links uh, to NCAN, to USPIRE, FSA, FSA um, you know, and also CSAC newsletters. This will also be part of our take-home resources. Um, so feel free to take a screenshot, but again, um, you do complete that form. We will be sending all of this out uh, to you all. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And also, we want to remind you all that we do have our 10,000 degree scholarship, which will be opening up within the next uh, few weeks. So it opens on December 1st, and we have a priority deadline of March 2nd. Had the link there for you all. But just wanted to remind you that this is open to all of the students on the regions that we serve. And as a reminder, there is no GPA or test score requirements, no citizenship or documentation student status requirement either. Um, and it's really open to all students, right? The, um, 
um, those that are, you know, trying to do any career programs that are enrolling at community college, four-year university, as long as they want to continue with their education, this is open up to them. Um, also, how to apply, students will need to submit a financial aid application before they can apply. Um, and now with our new process that we have, students will get to apply through um, their 10,000 degree student portal. And if you have any questions, feel free to connect with us, reach out to us. Um, you have you know, 10,000 degree staff member on campus, they will have more information uh, once the official application deadline, um, official application um, opens. Perfect. And just some more, again, um, you know, workshops that are coming up and can getting ready for the better FAFSA. Some of y'all might have already attended some of these, but I think for me, the more I attend, the better I understand um, the new process of the FAFSA application, right? So we just wanted to highlight those here for you all as well as that you aspire preparing for the better FAFSA webinar that is also happening later in this month. Um, and lastly, obviously, the 10,000 degree scholarship. So I already talked a little bit about that one. But again, feel free to screenshot these if um, you know you would like to attend. Um, they're open to the public. They're great information, right? Um, and we want to gather as much information as possible. Yeah, so just a couple of the things um, happening, right? Um, we have some train the trainers. Nothing scheduled for, for December, but for the um, new... Um, spring semester coming up, we will have two more talking about offer letters as well as career programming. Um, you will be hearing from our 10,000 degree staff uh, the closer we get to these um, dates, but it might be good to mark them in your calendar from, uh, from today just to have them there, right? Again, this will be part of a take-home resource, so we'll be able to share uh, more, more information as, as the dates um, approach. Perfect. And some other virtual events that are open to families and students. So, you know, we will have a family financial aid information night on November 29th. So coming up in the next few weeks and then leading up to um, the priority of the deadline for the FAFSA application on April 2nd of next year. We will also be hosting some financial aid submit workshops for our students and families to again attend, come gather their information, right? Um, and ensure that you know they're submitting those on time. Uh, so mark this in your calendars, share with students as you know you connect with them. Again, we will be sharing all these resources with you all. Um, very important that you know we have this in mind as you know, we have we know that with the new applications, yeah, many, many questions will will arise. All right. So uh, without further ado, we can jump into some case scenarios that uh, we gather and put together here for you all. Um, and yeah, I think we can go to the next slide and begin tackling the, the first one. So I'm gonna ask from you all to, again, come prepare with like any questions, any challenges, feel free to share. if You might know the answers to some of these. We wanna hear um, all the information that you, know, you might know and you know, tackle these um, together. But this is the first scenario. So student Amy is in the process of filling out her FAFSA. She is a dependent student and her parents filed a joint tax return for 2022. Form requires her to fill in parent information to invite them to contribute to her FAFSA form, right? So the students, um, the fields that they input are the parent's legal name, social security, date of birth, and email address. She fills the information for the mom, but the mom does not receive an invitation to provide information. What could be the reasons that her mother did not receive the invitation? How could Amy fix the situation so that her mother gets the invitation? So if y'all can uh, share with us any thoughts in the chat, uh, what do y'all think? What will be the first steps um, to begin tackling um, the challenges that Amy's going through. Mm. A typo, yes. Contact financial aid department. Mm -hmm. What else come to mind? Exactly, yeah. So Amy will need to double check that the information she plugged in is, is correct. Uh-huh. 
what else comes to mind for you all? Thank you though for sharing, appreciate it. All right, well, I mean, I think pretty much that sums it up, right? Um, one possible idea is that the student might have entered maybe an incorrect email address, right? And the invitation was never received. Also, uh, maybe the student and parent's name uh, is different. Maybe they, they enter the social security information wrong. Um, date of birth could also be wrong, right? And it's important to keep in mind that the email address that the contributor invitation is sent to does not need to be the one that um, was used to establish the mother's FSA ID. However, when the mom does receive the invitation and attempts to log in, everything has to match, right? So her name, her date of birth, her social security. Um, otherwise, again, there might be some, uh, some challenges and yeah, we'll have to make sure that those match and, and are correct. Also, the other thing that could happen is the parent might have just created an FSA ID, right? And it hasn't been verified yet. So FAFSA can't really match the information at that time. So um, all of those things, again, thank you. Thank you for answer. Lastly, um, another thing that comes to mind, right? The scenario does highlight that um, the student is a dependent student and her parents filed a joint tax return. So what does that mean if the parents do file a joint tax return for you all? Or what other option could Amy do? All right, well, again, given that, Exactly. Thank you, Dixie. Appreciate it. So yeah, so essentially, right, assuming the parents are married, they're filing the taxes jointly, if they're having challenges with the mom's information, um, and they just can't get it figured out, right, the other option will be to send out the information to um, the dad, who could also complete the FAFSA information um, on their behalf, given that they do file their taxes um, jointly. So thank you. Thank you for that. All right, so we can go on to scenario number two. So student Jose is ready to file his FAFSA. Jose is a U.S. citizen, but his parents are undocumented. His parents do not have ITINs. Each parent has attempted to set up an FSA ID via the new system for those without SSN. So um, the system that Abby was just talking about earlier, um, his father was successful but his mother could not establish an FSA ID with the online process. Jose has a priority deadline in three days. No good, no good. We don't want this, right? Uh, what steps should Jose and his parents take to get the FAFSA submitted by the deadline? Um, what is the rationale? So what comes to mind for this specific scenario? Any questions that we might um, prompt to ask the student? Ask Jose. Okay, well, as, let's see, we have something in the chat. Yes, so both parents will need to create an FSA ID, right? Um, depending on their situation, yeah, visit financial aid office, but anyways, contact FAFSA, exactly, exactly. So all, all of those things, right? I think, um, you know, a really option for, for Jose, just given that this is close to the deadline, um, if, you know, first things first, if they cannot verify the identity through the knowledge-based identity verification process, uh, <clears throat> best thing that they can do is contact the federal student aid um, directly and submit any documentation that, you know, they might need to in order to verify. If that process does not work, um, then the suggestion here will be for our students to complete, for the students and parents to complete and submit a paper FAFSA form, especially given that, um, you know, Jose is right there at the deadline to submit. Um, if, you know, we can't not match those, um, those um, identities, we can do the paper form so that, you know, we can mail it out and have it be submitted before that priority um, deadline. Does that make sense? Do we have any other questions? Exactly, yeah. So why would both his parents need to create an FSA ID? Yeah, because they're undocumented, right? And, and no ITINs. Also assuming that, you know, for this particular case is a little bit special, but 
you know, maybe you might have parents that are undocumented, but they do file taxes and you file jointly, right? Then the process might be a little bit different, um, but I'm just going based on this specific scenario. Um, and yeah, because again, they don't have um, any documentation, SSN or no ITINs, but we'll have to create an FSA ID. So scenario number three and final scenario, a college access advisor is assisting student Jeremy and his mom at a FAXA workshop. Jeremy's mom and dad have been separated for a year while attempting to answer the parent wizard questions for separated parents. Mother indicates that each parent provides an equal amount of financial uh, support for Jeremy and their shared custody arrangement means that Jeremy lives an equal amount of time with each parent. Jeremy's father pays his mother 400 per month in child support. So how should the access advisor guide them in completing the FAFSA? What types of questions might the advisor ask to determine uh, parents' financial information and which one belongs on the FAFSA? What do you all think? See a question in the chat, just the mother will be the contributor. So it'll depend, right? It'll depend on a few things. Um, per the FAFSA, they do indicate that the parent whose financial information belongs on the form in cases of a separation or a divorce will be those who provide the most financial support for the last 12 months, right? So this specific scenario does stay, right? That both parents provide an equal amount of financial support. So we might have to ask the student some questions, right? To try to find out like who pays, you know, a little bit extra, maybe, you know, some parents pay for health insurance and they pay a premium for that. Maybe one parent pays, you know, child support, which in this case does stay that they pay um, child support. Maybe one parent covers car insurance or other, again, necessities um, for the students. Um, and if that's the case, right, and we will go based on those that provide the most amount of financial support within the last 12 months. Um, if there's nothing that breaks the tie, for example, um, FSA does recommend that parent with the highest income or assets be reported on the form. Any questions about this specific scenario? So again, we want to go essentially with that parent that provides the most amount um, of support. If there's really no way of determining that, we would essentially go with the parent that makes um, essentially the more the more money. Already, I do see a question um, in the chat. So, right. But if the father pays child support, uh, you would figure that the student lives with the mother more than the father. Um, yeah, that's correct. Uh, but uh, moving forward, it will now be uh, who supports the student financially within the last 12 months. Um, previously, it was who the student lived with the la the previous 12 months. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. No, great question. All right, y'all. Well, I think with that, that concludes the end of the presentation. Uh, we will now open it up for uh, Q&A if anyone has any further questions about the presentation. But we just want to thank you all for uh, your engagement, being present, asking all those great questions in the chat. Really appreciate you all. Hope that you all learned something new today. And again, remember that we're here. Reach out to us if anything. Reach out to that staff member within your campus. Or yeah, just reach out to us in general. We're here to, to support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to run this by like, uh, sometimes we have students that are um, in transition, let it be homeless, and then, um, um, or situations where even they're not homeless, but the parents refuse to assist with the FAFSA application. How would you proceed uh, with the new FAFSA? Mm -hmm. Is it the same as before where they just skip those questions and then they discuss that with the receiving college. Jose, do you want to jump in for that one? Yeah, as as far as we know, yeah, that would still be the process. Um, it would, you know, 
student answer as best as they can, as accurate as they can, the uh, FAFSA application and then, um, or the California Dream Act, um, and then um, talking with their particular schools uh, about how they would want them to uh, make those edits if any edits need to be made and what documentation follows after that. But as far as we know, it will be the same process. Thank you. There are no further questions. Again, y'all, thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your engagement. Uh, and again, we hope that you can live today with, with something new. So we appreciate you all. And uh, thank you. Thank you for, yeah, for being here today. Thank you.